right, we're almost there. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is Thursday, November 3rd. You are at MS Office Hours. I am one of your co-hosts, Heather Cox, and with me today is... I am Victoria Dean. And we have our wonderful Teams Voice Guru. Um, first of all, give me a thumbs up before Nate starts. Thumbs up reaction. If you understood the I've fallen and I, I can't get up, and that was in the email. Ah, yeah. Nate was like, well, people get it. And I was like, this crowd's going to get it. They will, for sure. So, all right, Nate. Turning it over to you to educate us all on uh, E911 here. Thanks, Heather. So I've fallen and I can't get up and I can't speak because I've knocked the wind out of myself. How does emergency services know where to come to me and help me? How does emergency services know where to go? Can you all see the, can, can, Oh, hopefully they're not seeing the, the speaker notes. You don't see the speaker notes, right? No, you're good. Okay, great. Um, so how do we configure teams so that when someone makes an emergency call, emergency services know where to go? Which is super important, especially in the case of schools, um, because we want that ambulance or we want those police to show up to the correct location. And we do this uh, leveraging a couple of different technologies, which I'm going to go over. Um, and so I have some questions here on the screen, and, and, and these are typically the questions that first come to mind for me when I'm thinking about uh, customers and my conversations with them around emergency services. Do we care? I think we should care. Um, should someone in your organization be notified when someone makes an emergency call? Uh, maybe, maybe not. What about work from home users? This is a question I get all the time. Hey, Nate, how do we account for work from home users making a 911 call? All great questions. And the impetus or the, the driving force behind a lot of the conversations within the last year and a half, as some of you will well be aware, uh, are two particular pieces of legislation. Uh, the first one is Kerry's Law. And Kerry's Law uh, was enacted a couple of years ago uh, because, um, uh, well, I don't really want to go into that story. It's a, it's a terrible story. Um, but because of that terrible story, we have a great law um, that requires organizations to do three things. Uh, first, it requires that if you give a dial pad to somebody, that they can make a 911 call. And that 911 call should be able to be made without having to dial a nine or some other number to get an outside line. Um, and the next thing that's required is that some location information should be available to locate uh, emergency services when a person makes an emergency call. Well, that was great, and that worked really well a couple of years ago when that law was first passed. Um, but since then, technology has changed quite a bit, and we now have this concept of people predominantly working from home or we have this concept of people using soft phones, an application on their computer or an app on their mobile phone that allows them to make telephone calls. And this really complicated the industry quite a bit uh, because the technology that drove the ability or the technology that enabled the ability for organizations to provide location information under Carey's law has now changed quite a bit. So with the Ray Bomb Act, we have a whole new set of technology available to us that allows us to dynamically, at the, at the moment in time a user dials 911, to detect where they're located and send that information to emergency services. Do we have to do this? So 
do we have to do this um, is a great question and hashtag Nate's not a lawyer hashtag Nate can't give you legal advice um, so what I recommend um, to pretty much all customers is talk to your legal team and ask them to interpret those two laws for you and tell you what do we actually need to do and usually your legal team will come back to you with a phrase and that phrase will be dispatchable location and a dispatchable location is the area roughly speaking of where the person is when they make a 911 call what that term means is ambiguous uh, the laws are not precise they do not tell us exactly what a dispatchable location is and this is where our legal team comes into play because our legal team can interpret the law appropriate for our own organization and tell us what we need to do with a dispatchable location. Inside of Microsoft, we did that. And we settled on uh, a couple of criteria of what a dispatchable location is for Microsoft. But that is not necessarily appropriate for all organizations and all customers. So I have a great big asterisk next to the, the header on this slide that says, Every customer should talk to your legal team, and this is what Microsoft did. Uh, but inside of Microsoft, we broke it down a little bit, and we said, if a building is larger than 25,000 square feet, or it has more than one floor, then we're going to divide that building up into multiple different dispatchable locations. But if the building is less than 25,000 square feet, um, and uh, it's a single floor, then we'll only have one dispatchable location for the whole building. Now, some customers have come to me and said, Nate, that's great, but that doesn't work for us. What we need is we need to get down to the individual desk or the individual room of uh, each room in our buildings. Great, we can do that. Um, so the first thing I would say is talk to your real estate team and get a really good understanding of what your real estate looks like. What you're seeing on the slide here is an example of one of Microsoft's office locations where that location had multiple floors and each floor exceeded 25,000 square feet. We divided the floor up into four quadrants and we used compass directions to help us indicate which portion of each floor equated to a dispatchable location. Another example in the Microsoft Office uh, space is a single floor that was less than 25,000 square feet. And in this scenario, we were able to have a single dispatchable location for a single floor. What is a dispatchable location? You all can't respond and that's okay. Um, but again, a dispatchable location is the rough definition of where a, loc a user is located when they dial an emergency call. And how descriptive do we need to be with how we name a dispatchable location? I get this question a lot too. How descriptive you need to be with a dispatchable location is very unique and it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis based on the building and colloquial um, terms that are used to describe that building. Sometimes you will have a building that has a great big sign on the front of the building, and it's really hard for anybody who drives up to that building to miss what that building is called colloquially based on the sign on the building. But that might not be what the building is called from a US Postal Service perspective. It may not be what you refer to the building uh, from a, a mailing address perspective. My recommendation is when you name a dispatchable location, name it based on that great big sign hanging on the front of the building so that when the police or the fire truck drives up to your campus, there's no ambiguity that they should go to 
the middle school versus the high school in case they're two buildings right next to each other. In teams, we have four technologies or, or four services or four things, whatever, whatever term you want to use. We have four things that help us determine where the user is located when they make a 911 call. And I'm going to get out my fancy little laser pointer here so I can point at the screen. And there we go. There we go. Everybody should see my laser pointer now. So the first thing that we ask, the first question that we ask is, what is the internet IP address of the user? The public internet IP address of the user. We ask this question for one reason, and the answer is binary. It's either yes or no. And the question is, is the user on your network? Or is the user somewhere other than your network? So we look at the internet IP address of the user and we say, all right, is Nate on Microsoft's network? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then we ask another series of questions. Okay, cool. Where on Microsoft's network is Nate located? What switch is Nate plugged into? Or maybe what switch port is Nate plugged into? Or maybe Nate uses Wi-Fi. What Wi-Fi access point is Nate connected to? And if I don't know any of those three things, I, as a last resort, I can fall back to what's the private subnet? The private subnet that is given to me by my DHCP server. I can use one of those four pieces of information to figure out where Nate is. Great, all right, so I know where Nate's at and I need to do something with that information. So maybe I want to notify somebody. Maybe I wanna notify a person that Nate dialed 911. Well, I can make a choice. I can notify people based on what building Nate's in. So maybe I wanna notify Sally in the high school if Nate happens to be in the high school when he dials an emergency call. Or maybe I want to notify Jim in the middle school if Nate's over on the middle school uh, side of the campus when he dials an emergency call. And I can control that using this thing in Teams called an emergency calling policy. Now, if I'm a direct routing customer and I need to route that telephone call a different way, then in direct routing scenarios, I can also use this thing called a Teams, Microsoft Teams emergency call routing policy. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated than I want to go into today, but if you have questions on that, absolutely happy to answer those. I mentioned that we can control or we can choose who we want to notify based on an emergency calling policy. And we pick what emergency calling policy is assigned to a user based on their network site location. And a network site is defined based on a private subnet. And I can organize my sites logically if that helps me. Um, but essentially, whatever subnet a user is in and whatever calling emergency calling policy is assigned to that subnet will take precedence over the calling, the emergency calling policy that's assigned to the user. So I can use both. So normally I might say, you know what, Nate's got calling uh, emergency calling policy, Nashville, Tennessee, because he's based out of Nashville. But if he travels to Redmond, when he's in Redmond, because he's in Redmond, I'm gonna give him a site assignment of a Redmond emergency calling policy. All right, that's great. But how does my Teams client know all of this? So the Teams client is pretty cool. It's location aware. It talks to the operating system, whatever that operating system happens to be. Linux, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, doesn't matter. Teams client's going to talk to it and say, hey, where am I? Hey, where am I? I'm here. Where am I? I want to know where I'm at. Uh, and it does that a lot. Every, like five minutes or so, or it will do that whenever you start the Teams client, or it will do that 
whenever you have a network change event. What do I mean by a network change event? Uh, I mean, I unplugged my network cable and plugged it in somewhere else, or I was walking down the hallway and I roamed from one wireless access point to another, or I was on Wi-Fi on my cell phone, but I got in my car and drove down the street and got out of range of my access point at home, so now I'm on cellular mobile broadband. The Teams client's smart enough to pick, pick up those events and know about them and kick off a discovery process. And that discovery process is essentially the Teams client gathering up as much information as it can about the network that it's connected to, sending that information up to the Teams Location Information Services, Location Information Services, or LIS for short, and the Teams client will say, hey, Mr. LIS service, this is what I know about the network that I'm connected to. Where am I? Please, please tell me where I am. And LIS will respond back and say, Teams client, you're located at this dispatchable location, and these are your GPS coordinates. The Teams client does not then tell the Teams service in the cloud where it's located, and the Teams service in the cloud does not keep a record of where the user is located. That's all protected and stored on the Teams client only. And we do that for privacy reasons. Now, I know there are other third-party systems that uh, can track where people are in real time on your network, um, but we don't do that. We've, that's a, we've, we've made a conscious de decision to not do that. Um, but the Teams client will store its dispatchable location and it will cache it for a period of time, about five minutes or so. And in the event that the person needs to make an emergency call, uh, that dispatchable information will be included as part of the emergency call and sent to this thing or this service that we refer to as an emergency routing service or ERS for short. ERSs are required. I can't get around that. They are included in Microsoft calling plans and Operator Connect and they are uh, an additional requirement for direct routing. Where you get them can vary. Uh, some telco carriers will provide them for you, uh, and then some, some customers have chosen to uh, go out and purchase those services in addition to carrier services and run them separately. Either way is perfectly fine, uh, but we do need an emergency routing service. So we will send the dispatchable location to the emergency routing service, and the emergency routing service will then make a choice. Where do I need to send this emergency call? And where it will end up is a place called a public safety answering point, or PSAP for short. And which PSAP it goes to is based on the dispatchable location. So, that's a lot of information, and I just tore through a whole bunch of content that I typically spend two, sometimes four hours uh, working with customers on. And so I want to start with how do we get started? Or, or I should say, I, I want to move next into how or where do we get started? And I've mentioned this already, but it's a really important point. Aligning with your legal counsel to define what your institutional requirements are is super important. This has either made customers super successful from the get-go and sort of greased their wheels and made them fly at lightning speed at implementing this, or it's in some customer scenarios, it's 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 really drug things out. So don't be the customer that that drags out this process. Uh, start with your legal counsel, get your definitions in order, um, because once you understand what's required of you from your legal counsel, then we have a basis, a starting point to start configuring the environment. Uh, the next one, my favorite topic, the network. So once your legal team says, great, this is what you need to do, the next piece of this puzzle is working very closely with the people who manage and operate your network. 
and why why do i put that as number two on my list i put that as number two on my list because we heavily use the network to determine where the user is located that's great and i've worked with some pretty big schools who have literally hundreds of thousands of switches and access points across their their district or their campuses and so the next point that's super important is a sustainable data model that you can use and ideally automate the acquisition and maintenance of network information into the team's location information services. Next point, responsibility. Have more than one person, ideally from different teams, be responsible for the cleanliness of your data model, for managing the, the, the data from a moves, adds, changes, and deletions perspective. So every, every time a switch on your network gets replaced, or every time you put a new switch into production, or every time you uh, remove an access point from a building, we need to know about it because we want to locate the users. So responsibility, have somebody responsible for owning your sustainable data model. And then start with a single building. Don't try to boil the ocean on day one. Start small. We've all heard the phrase crawl before we run or crawl before we walk and walk before we run. This absolutely applies to dynamic emergency calling. Starting with a single building will help you prove out your processes with your data model and your responsibilities and give you valid tests and, and reassurance that things are working the way you expect them to work. The next thing is decide who uh, is going to be notified, if anybody, and, and build a map uh, or build a data set to say, this building, uh, these people will be notified. This building over here, these people will be notified. And then decide what you're going to do from an ERS perspective. If you're a Microsoft Calling Plans customer or you're an Operator Connect customer, you don't need to worry about this. It's included. If you're a direct routing customer, still don't need to worry about it, but definitely need to plan for it and think about it um, because we will definitely want an ERS. There are four certified ERSs, um, and there are other ERSs that are not certified that work just fine. Uh, the, the, the top four are bandwidth.com, Intrado, Intelliquent, and I'm gonna I'm gonna forget the fourth one. I'm, I'm sure somebody will remind me of it. Um, but I have a, a handy dandy URL at the bottom of a lot of my slides that contains more information. And I encourage you all to check those out. I'm going to give you, or I should say, I, I will make available this slide deck uh, some way or another. I'll, I'll confer with Heather, uh, but I'll make sure that everybody gets this slide deck. And I've included a little, uh, a little freebie at the end here, uh, because something that I haven't talked about that I do want to demonstrate really quickly for you is that work from home scenario. What do we do with work from home users? Well, if I determine that a user is not on my network, then I want to do the best that I can to try and determine where they're located. And I'm going to ask the operating system, hey, Mr. Operating System, where am I? Uh, and if the team's application has been granted access to the operating system's location services, then it's going to ask another question. Did the operating system have a location available? Um, and and if, if so, we're not actually going to use that location. Uh, we just we just want to know if Teams has permission to detect location. Uh, and if it does, we're actually going to look at the internet connection that the user is using. And we're going to try and use that internet connection with publicly available databases to determine where the user is located. And this is if you care, the same 
types of publicly available databases that ad services use to determine what types of uh, geographical based ads they should serve to you. Once we have a rough estimate of where the user is located, we're going to give the user three options. They can simply confirm, yep, that's where I'm located. They could edit the location and then confirm it, or they could do nothing. Uh, if they do nothing, we don't really have a good idea of where they're located. So we're going to route their emergency call to a national based screening center to intercept that call and check with the user audibly to see where they might be located. If the user edits and then confirms the address, we're still going to route that call to a national call center just to verify. But if the user simply clicks the confirm button and says, yes, that's indeed where I'm located, um, then we're going to route that call to whatever the public safety answering point is based on the address that the uh, was populated in the Teams client. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to show you what the work from home scenario in a Teams client looks like. Let's see here. Jump over to this computer that I have and I'm signed in with a user named Corey, Corey Gray. Corey's on Teams. He has a dial pad in Teams. He has a phone number assigned to him and he can make an emergency call. And you notice right below the parked calls button, I have an address 1409 Peachtree Street, Northeast Atlanta, Georgia. Now, show a thumbs up. How many people think that's where I'm located? Or how many people think that's where Corey's located? Anybody? Corey's not in Georgia. Corey's in Florida. So that's wrong. So Corey's going to come in here and he's going to edit this address and he's going to say, you know what? I'm at 123 Main Street. I'm on the first floor. I'm in Somerville, Florida. 12345. Six, seven. And I'm going to confirm that. And now, if Corey makes an emergency call, that's where emergency services are going to show up. So let's try it. Let's dial 933 because that's my test emergency call service. And if I call 933, it's going to make a lot of racket. Um, but you can see all these people just got pulled into my emergency call. Well, it's also telling me right here, that's the location that's going to get sent to emergency services. So I'm going to cancel that. And I'm going to switch to another computer where one of those people that you saw just got notified of that emergency call is signed in. And that person's name is Nate Adam. And if I pull up Nate Adams Teams client here, you can see that Corey Gray placed an emergency call at 123 Main Street, Somerville, Florida. What do you guys think? Cool. I was going to show you the uh, the work location and how that works, but there is a, a cloud minute on any changes that you make in your team's admin center. and. Uh, I've been tapping my feet and watching my watch all afternoon and it still hasn't worked yet. So I can't demonstrate that for you, um, but uh, I would be happy to take any questions and we are right at time. Um, so I'll answer a couple questions in the chat and otherwise, thank you all for your time. Yeah, so that's perfect. And and like Nate said, he'll answer questions in the chat. So make sure you uh, check out that chat for those um clearly nate knows what he's talking about so you know i would listen to him i mean i do i listen because <laughs> he's got a lot of great things to say so uh thank you nate thank you for being here thank you to everybody who attended uh as soon as Great this job, 
soon as this uh, saves, this recording saves, I will go ahead and turn around and get it uploaded to the YouTube channel so that you have access to it personally and can feel free to share it with others. So thank you all for being here. We will see you again next week. Bye, everyone. Have a great night.